What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. Welcome, bike, to Bunk Bed Breakdowns, which is BDGE's own Dynasty Fantasy Football featured film of the week every Wednesday morning. I am joined. Well, this is their show, but sometimes I join them. That is Noah at FB God. That is Mike at Mike Me Up on Twitter. Make sure you are following both of them. We have a a very very cool announcement today, Michael. And no, I don't know if you've even been working on this or whatever, but it's, we got a bunch of fucking nerds in the background working to make sure that we have pulled together the ADP, the average draft position data from all of our big dogs dynasty leagues. So right now in Discord, I believe what we're we're north of seventy five, right? Eighty. Uh, we're at eighty one. We're at eighty, and we are fucking chugging along. I, we're gonna hit a thousand by the end of the summer. <laughs> I want a thousand not. leagues. In there. <laughs> a thousand leagues. Noah, you're commi- you're fucking co commissioning all of them. Mike, you're getting the ADP data from all of them. We got a bunch of leagues uh, through Discord. Most of them are money. Most of them are paid. So we have been taking all the ADP data from it, and we are shoving it into your faces today. The full list of ADP is in the draft guide. So that is an exclusive piece of content right now. MonkeyKnifeFight.com. If you use the promo code BDGE when you sign up, you will get 10 bucks to play with on there. You will get the draft guide, the rookie guide, the dynasty, the season long, the fucking Dr. Morse injury guide. You will get Michael. You can give you a hand job over there. Today, we are talking about the best values according to the ADP data that we have derived. I've got no more energy left in me, so you guys can take it over. Look, let me tell you why. This Let's ADP hit that intro. Is- <laughs> <laughs> Let's fucking go. Look, let me tell you why this ADP data is important. And, you know, we're going to come out with the Bible verse two, which I just fucking spent all weekend writing. Uh, It's going to be in there as well. But just so you guys know. Look, a lot of the, there's a lot of ADP data out there, and I'm going to tell you right now, most of it is just trash, and it's not usable because – I'll tell you why. Because people are doing them, like, via mock drafts, and I don't know about you, but if there's no money on the line, I don't give a fuck. Like, I will, I will draft fucking, you know, Mitch Trubisky in the fifth round if I want to. I don't give a damn in a single quarterback league. But, like – and, like, the other problem is, like, most people time out, right? So, like, after you go – the most exciting part of the draft is, like, what, rounds, like, one to eight? Nobody gives a shit about, like, double-digit rounds, like, Hey, Scott does. I, Scott cares a lot about those rounds. <laughs> Look, I barely care about those rounds in real money drafts. So how much do you think people are going to care about them in uh, fake drafts? And they just don't. And then the other thing is like, look, like a lot of these mock drafts are like with like Twitter experts and analysts and, and all these guys that are like, you know, all part of the same like group thing type thing. But like at the end of the day, like you're not playing against those guys, right? Like how many of you guys are playing against like a lot of these like, uh, like mad following Twitter guys? Probably not, not many, right? So for the most part, if you're in the discord, you're playing with other people in BDGE, and this is what the ADP is made from. So when I say that there's a chance that you're playing with people that made this ADP data, uh, I'm actually, that's not even hyperbole. A, I know there's, a, there's some big, guys big that are literally fast. in like 12 leagues that I, when I was looking at the ADP data, like there's guys that are in literally 12 leagues. So there's a chance that if you join a new league, you're probably playing with one of them, and you have that competitive advantage because this data is made from people that put real – fucking american dollars down okay to play well, they gotta be american uh because this is the u.s of a okay? <laughs> we, and league safe and team safe only take u.s dollars i'm pretty sure all right why uh, <laughs> so <laughs> look it, the, the this Straight is gonna up, be this is the best adp data yeah. in the industry i have it no is. doubt I, I have complete confidence in saying that because like you said all the other data is pulled from secondary sources that are not paid leagues their mock drafts are from the same people doing the same drafts over and over and over again this is real data from real pay drafts that we have with just people that love fantasy football so i'm really pumped uh really pumped about this mike thank you and whoever else uh westron shout out to westron baby westron westron you're the goat for that so uh let's talk about some of our favorite values that we see in the adp landscape right now who wants to kick this off i think we should just start off with our boy kind of look like him wish i could grow a stash (laughs) gardner Minshew, quarterback for the jacksonville jaguars currently the quarterback did i go get animal he's downstairs eating uh fucking mcdonald's right now (laughs) (laughs) he kind of looks like him if we like animorph we would look like him but we got gardner (laughs) Minshew. someone do that someone do one of those fucking pictures where you take the baby of noah and animal and then it fucking becomes gardner (laughs) Minshew. sorry Uh, so per bdge adp he is the quarterback 25 off the board 89th overall and when you see a bunch of guys going ahead of him, like Drew Locke is the quarterback 15 off the board. 
And sure, you can argue that Drew Locke doesn't have a little bit more continuity and a little more staying power because he isn't a sixth round pick. But looking at what the two did last year, like Gardner Minshew isn't far behind. And I would even argue that he had a better rookie year. I mean, that's subjective, right? He had almost a better rookie year than Kyler Murray. If you pace out his 16 game season from games he played 100% of the snaps, it was 3,799 yards, 24 touchdowns, five interceptions, 440 rushing yards. Kyler Murray, 3,722 yards, 20 touchdowns, 12 interceptions, 544 rushing yards. So everything was worse except for the rushing yards, which is to be expected. But Gardner Minshew is somebody who not only gives you valuable points through the air, but he can also do it on the ground. And the fact that they've added second round wide receivers in two of the past three years and DJ Chark and LaVisca Chanel and the fact that Leonard Fournette is a pile of shit. Their offensive line stinks. They're trading every single piece they had on the defensive side of the ball. Leads me to believe that even with John DeFilippo, however you pronounce his last name, leaving town, they're still going to have to throw. And Jay Gruden comes in, and although he isn't as pass happy as DeFilippo, he showed with Kirk Cousins that when he had a quarterback that wasn't Alex Smith, he isn't afraid to sling the ball. Gardner Minshew is just that. He's going to have every opportunity to prove himself this year. And you can, you can easily say they're going to go out and draft Trevor Lawrence next year or Justin Fields. We also thought Miami was going to have zero wins this year and take two out 101. They luckily got him at 105. But you can't just pencil these teams in to be terrible because they're in a division with Phillip Rivers, who's going to hand out the ball like it's charity. They're in a division with Bill O'Brien, who does not want to win games. And then, you know, Tennessee, Derrick Henry, whatever. So uh, they're in a division that's going to be able to give away a few wins here and there. Gardner Minshew might be able to keep his job because, one, I think he's a pretty good quarterback. And number two, you can't just pencil them in to be the number one pick in 2021. If you looked at his numbers and you didn't know it was Gardner Minshew, like you kind of alluded to in the beginning, 21 to six touchdown to interception ratio as a sixth round rookie quarterback is, is like unbelievable. And it's going so far under the radar, literally just because he doesn't have the draft capital. And now you're adding these guys like LaVisca Chanel, which plays to the hand of people, the quarterbacks that aren't as accurate because these are line, line, line of the scrimmage guys, right? You're getting targets around the line of scrimmage, letting them make plays after the fact. Even adding a guy like Chris Thompson, who gives you some explosion out of the backfield from the passing game where you're not just throwing it to Leonard Fournette and he's fucking doing juke moves that, that don't go anywhere. They go out of bounds and shit. Chris Thompson can add a little bit of an explosion there. So you like the addition of the weapons. I love Gruden as an offensive coordinator. I think he's going to be good for the offense, throwing the ball downfield a little bit more. And I forget what podcast I heard this on, but – uh, with his rushing numbers, I think it was like any quarterback who had the same amount of rush attempts or the same number of rush attempts per game, they all had at least three rushing touchdowns. So uh, you can expect his rushing numbers to go back up. He's, he's an athletic guy, so he's going to have that rushing part of the game to him. You know, for fantasy, that's such an unlock. Uh, and if you expect those numbers to go back up, you know, three, four rushing touchdowns this year, uh, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibilities. And that, you know, boosts you so heavily in the passing game, even if he does take a little bit of a step back there. So I love Gardner here too. And just yeah, looking love- at his pure rushing numbers per game, sorry to cut you off, Mike, but you think of Deshaun Watson as somebody who's going to run a ton and get you a ton of value on the ground. He only averaged two more rushing yards per game than Gardner Minshew last year. Almost two and a half points per game from Minshew's point total came from his legs. I wants to say he's not Blake Bortles 2.0. He's just going to keep doing that because their offensive line isn't good. And if their offensive line improves, then guess what? He has more weapons to feed the ball, and they're good after the catch, and they're able to pick up yards after the catch for him to put up more fantasy points. Yeah, look, I mean, all I'll say on Gardner is, like, obviously the risk is he's going to get replaced. But the thing is, like, he's already priced as if everyone already assumes that he's going to exactly. get replaced. Like, what if we're all wrong? What if he hits? Yeah. Like, like yeah. You just, you just what if he's cousins? Backpack. Like, what if he's the next cousins, right? And, like, people are drafting guys like – you know, Drew Brees and Tom Brady over him, where you just know, you know, for a fact, those guys are only going to be one to two year rentals. There is no upside. Like none of them are playing until 50, even though Tom Brady thinks that he is, but like on the off chance that Gardner Minshew actually improves one and two, like does better than people think and retains his job, like getting a quarterback for sixth round rookie salary that cannot be understated. And I think if he proves like, even remotely like capable, they're going to give him some runway here. So it's just basically like, it's one of those instances where like, risk reward is not matched up uh it's very little risk to draft him and it's just like massive reward so just- I, I also think like on that point where like you're getting guys drew Brees and tom brady's around there you're drafting those guys knowing you have them for one year two years maximum i mean even if you think worst case scenario for Minshew, that's also the the what you're getting from Minshew, right but i would argue even if Minshew has a bad year this year his rushing ability is still going to put him within like five rankings of like a drew Brees. like drew Brees, maybe quarterback 11 or some shit this year right Minshew, as long as he's on the field for 16 games will probably be like a top 16 quarterback plus you know you bake those two in together and you're getting Minshew if he does hit 
at 24 years old. So I don't, yeah, I, I don't see any uh, world in where Minshew is not like a fantastic value in startup drafts right now. And even if he does suck this year, like where would he rank among the quarterback landscape in the league as far as backup quarterbacks go? Like he would be number one. And if any job opens up, everybody's going to be calling him. Like Teddy Bridgewater is getting, what, $20 million a year to throw five-yard slants to DJ Moore. There's no doubt in my mind that even if Gardner Minshew does get dethroned next year, he's going to have a job sometime in the future. Yeah, his one season, his rookie season, is already like more impressive on his resume than like most NFL quarterbacks have any single year on their resume. So he's definitely the best backup quarterback. So go go grab Minshew, please, if he keep, continues to fall. Yeah. Next up, Ryan Tannehill, the comeback king of uh, this year. And look, I think this is a case. There's a couple players on here that you'll find like this. It's just like it's a case where – Someone, you know, he's burned people in the past, like many times, even though for fantasy perspective, he's actually still kind of decent under Gase. Um, and then he came back and just had an absolute like monster season from like every single metric you can think of, um, especially the ones that matter, like like EPA and uh, CPOE, like completion percentage over expectation. He was a really, really good and really efficient quarterback. And I think people are just like, look, he was too good and he's going to regress. I love and, that. I love that in fantasy. <laughs> Yeah, and it's Bell just Aaron like, Jones right now. Too good, yeah. you have to fade him. Yeah, like he's just too good, and it can't happen, right? But his positional ADP is QB eighteen, right? So he's a low end QB two. He's still thirty two years old. Got that contract extension. Like, really, really, you know, understands the offense. He has. He's tied to AJ Brown. AJ Brown's tied to him going forward. I just think he also has a lot of rushing upside. Uh, sorry, rushing floor. I guess that we haven't seen before. Um. So I think I think he's just like a great QB too. Like I've loved picking him up as my quarterback too, as like that veteran. If I'm looking to win right now, he's just got got, got that great floor, you know. And if he if he regresses, which he probably will, because the TD percentage was definitely unsustainable, but he kind of makes up for it a little bit on the rushing side. I think he could be a pretty sneaky like upside like top 15 scoring quarterback. Yeah, I, I think what's super important there, um, the efficiency can come down, but when we're talking about super flex leagues. Like, you're not expecting your quarterback, two to have, a, you know, a top three ceiling for the most part, right? Like, the difference between – we talk about this all the time. difference between quarterback eight and 18 in scoring is so minimal that, like, okay, Tannehill might regress in the touchdown department, but at the end of the day, he's still going to finish in the top 15, which is not going to be for that far off from the top 10. You know what I mean? So, it's not like a, a big jump. If you don't think he's going to be good, his floor is still high enough to warrant quarterback two uh, situation. He's going in the sixth round right now. I mean, we just had our startup where we had a monster run of quarterbacks go off at the end of the fourth round into the early fifth round. I believe Tannehill maybe went off at the, what was it, the 502 in the yeah, NYC League? Something around that, yeah. Right, so he's 502 there. And I would say that that's like perfectly where you should be drafting him. And right now, according to our ADP, he's going in the sixth round. So, I mean, you're getting him at value still, uh, but probably won't be the case for much longer. It's not, that, it's not that difficult, man. He's got the contract, so he's locked in as our starter for three, three years. And you can't, you can't underestimate like, how powerful that is for just having that floor of a quarterback as your, as your two in Superflex. Yeah, and as for a quarterback, too, like you always – not that you always want to shoot for floor, but it's nice to have that safety valve because you know your QB1 is probably going to give you those elite weeks. The fact that he's going, you know, almost – yeah, exactly around after Drew Locke per ADP, 55 overall to 67 – Drew Locke had like one good game last year and sure they add a bunch of weapons but Tennessee looked like a very good offense last year and although the volume wasn't there they were extremely efficient and like Mike said even back in Miami he wasn't you know seen as a very good fantasy quarterback but looking at his like touchdown percentage numbers he had 6.2 touchdown percentage in 2018 in Miami where Devontae Parker wasn't who Devontae Parker is now I couldn't even name any other receivers maybe like Kenny Stills now they have a guy like AJ Brown Jonu Smith coming up Derrick Henry, uh, animal thinks he can catch. I don't know if he actually can. I don't I feel have like, any weapons. I feel but... like Albert Wilson's breakout was supposedly going to be that year too. <laughs> yeah, he's like 45 was. yards for route run because he went ran <laughs> one route and got 45 <laughs> yeah. yards on it. Yeah, uh, but yeah, the efficiency is there. And like, so what? Lamar Jackson doesn't throw the ball. And I know he, he runs a lot, but he's also very efficient throwing touchdowns. And I think that's what this Tennessee offense is built around, right? They just run Derrick Henry into the ground until they get in the end zone or around the red zone, and then they throw it to A.J. Brown, or he scores like a 90-yard touchdown. So you don't always need to chase volume. And even if you are, right, like guys like Jimmy Garoppolo are going in the same vicinity, and Jimmy Garoppolo was terrible last year, and that wasn't the same with uh, Ryan Tannehill. So he gives you that floor. He gives you that ceiling of being in a good offense. And as a quarterback, 18 off the board, he's just the perfect QB too. Big facts. Yep. Big facts. Those are the two value QBs. Get them. I pretty much try and have them on all my drafts uh, except for the – 
dynasty one the new york one because i got fucking it's like for all my dynasty there was you couldn't go into that with like any sort of normal quarterback yeah. fucking playing because everything went haywire <laughs> yeah uh next up we're gonna i'm gonna put i put someone on here um i put james connor i don't know how you guys feel about him but i think um just given how like rb crazy the drafts are going that i'm seeing uh you're gonna have to backfill with some veterans later on and james connor right now is going at 74th overall uh, as the RB25, so like in that, yeah, so as RB25, he's going behind guys like Singletary, Gurley, Melvin Gordon, and obviously the big question mark for him is always going to be health. This guy cannot stay healthy, but I think at th- at that price, like I'm willing to just take the weeks that he gives me. Um, like he was like, I think he was an RB10 last year from weeks one to eight, uh, when he was actually healthy, uh, but obviously, you know now they get big Ben back and you know, before they had duck Hodgins and Mason Rudolph with the trunk out of his head after he got hit in the face. Um, like they're just, that was not an offense that you wanted. If you think back to the more potent version of the Pittsburgh offense, uh, when big Ben was healthy, like Connor was dominating like goal line touches, right? Like we know Jalen Samuels is not running any goal line touches. Uh, we know that McFarland is probably not taking goal line touches. He's more of like that explosive back. So I think, you know, in an offense where Pittsburgh is healthy and Big Ben is back, I think he can provide like RB1 scoring on a points per game basis. And you just have to come to terms with the fact that he's not going to play a full season. And hopefully he plays the games that matter most for you in the playoffs. That's probably not going to happen. But what he does give you in terms of value is – you know, a lot of running backs go off the board in the first two, maybe even three rounds. And you're not going to be able, like, if you want to draft a Melvin Gordon, go right ahead. But you know that you're getting like one to two years of RB2 type of value. James Conner gives you the opportunity to fade the position. I think I got him in like the 12th round in the NYC league. And I don't expect him to have any type of longevity. But we're going to link that. We're going to, we're still in the middle of that draft, by the way. We're going to link the draft board on Sleeper. So you guys can go check out the draft whenever you want. We'll link it in the description on Discord. Yeah, but he, like, gives you the opportunity to fade the running back position if they don't fall at value. Grab him as your running back one for this year, maybe next year. I wouldn't really bank on it. But, you know, instead of reaching on other guys, like uh, I think Keyshawn Vaughn is going – Keyshawn Vaughn's going one spot after him. But, like, a Devin Singletary who does not have nearly the ceiling as a James Conner, I completely agree with Mike. He's going to be somebody that gives you a ton of receptions out of that backfield. He's going to be like Le'Veon Bell light. And even if that's only for eight to ten weeks – there aren't many running backs in this range or going a little bit after him that are ever going to hit that pinnacle, even if you're banking on the future. Yeah, you got him at the 12-1. Yeah. And it's funny you said Keyshawn Vaughn because Keyshawn Vaughn went like five rounds before James Conner did. <laughs> so Conner, I'm, I'm hesitant on Conner only because he fits that mold of guys. You know, any like veteran running back who's on their last year of the contract is a guy that you need to be weary of. But he's kind of the last one of those. You know, you have... Uh, you have Keyshawn Vaughn going, going before him, but you have like Leonard Fournette on his contract here. You have Todd Gurley on a one-year contract. You have Chris Carson who's on his uh, final year. And James Conner is getting picked behind all of those guys. So those are the guys you will get like almost one year. Like Mike, if you like James Conner, you're assuming it's for this year. Like what's best case scenario though? You think he'll get re-signed by Pittsburgh? Like what are the chances of that? Uh, I mean, re-signed by Pittsburgh? I think there's like, I, don't, I think that's actually not as Is there like, any chance unlikely. his value goes up after this year? I don't think so. Actually, from, the uh, from, from he, here, I, I, think I don't he know. I think if he up. puts up like an RB2 season, it can't go down from there. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I look, I just think like if you're trying to play a contending team, like he is a great RB3, right? An RB3, RB4, which is exactly where you're getting him Yeah. Um, for that points per game production. Like if you're a contender, I feel like he's going to be a good, a good value because like in redraft, I'm like, he was I'm great like on the field the last year. Yeah. yeah, he was great. Um, and it's like when he when he misses games, right? Like you don't start a zero in that slot. I think that's like the, that's why I like to look at points per game as well as like total games played, um, because like you're gonna put someone else in there, right? Like if you draft James Conner, maybe grab an Anthony McFarland, right? You can pair them and just kind of take that Pittsburgh backfield, and you it's possible to do both because they're cheap enough. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I, that's what makes dynasty startups so fun because you can like, you know, you could start picking guys like the J.K. Dobbins and DeAndre Swift and then have fucking all of Twitter chirping at you like, oh, DeAndre Swift's your RB2. And then you're like, bitch, I could still get James Conner and Melvin Gordon in the 12th round. And now Swift is like my RB4 or 5. So if you want to join a Dynasty League, make sure you're in the Discord because we got 81 of them. We got fucking <laughs> RIP to Kobe Bryant. We got 81 leagues popping off right now. Nope. Let's move on to the next one. Rest in peace, Jalen Rose. We got Kareem Hunt, <laughs> the RB27 off the board. And he's going behind James. What would you say? Sorry. 
I said, love this. I can't believe you picked that. You passed on him in the in that fucking uh, three picks in a row. To be honest, did I? Yeah, I'm a fraud because I'm completely going against my own beliefs. I would definitely take him ahead of Leonard Fournette. Something must have possessed me because I chose him ahead of him in the NYC league. But the running back 27 off the board doesn't make much sense to me because although he's gonna be 26 heading into this year. You look at the running back landscape next year, and there are so many teams that have free agents, whether it be Atlanta or Tennessee or Arizona, maybe Minnesota now. I don't know if Dalvin Cook's going to get his contract. but Kareem Hunt's going to end up either in Atlanta or San Francisco, guaranteed. Yeah, San Francisco as well. They have like three guys coming off the books. If you're telling me that a 27-year-old Kareem Hunt in 2021 is going to be the lead back for any of those teams, for redraft purposes for that year, he's going to be a top five, top six guy. And I know you might be wondering, oh, yeah, he's 27 years old. That means he's going to break down soon. He has, is he? like, half the total touches as an Ezekiel Elliott. I think he has 612 touches on his body because, you know, he missed a few games. I think in his rookie year, he missed a game. His second year, he obviously got suspended. He was out for most of last year. And kick that chick in the face. Yeah, Love he that. did a couple unspeakable things. But Mike <laughs> will speak did, on he it. He did that thing, too, though. <laughs> yeah. <he did> <laughs> But you look at the offense that he's named. in, they bring in Jack Conklin, they bring in Kevin Stefanski, who is a guy who loved running backs last year. Now that might have been Kubiak's system and the fact that Adam Thielen was hurt a lot of the year. But when you have Kareem Hunt, who is as good as he is, you have Nick Chubb, who is as good as he is, and you have the ability to throw to them out of the backfield, Kareem Hunt's going to be somebody that gives you value not only on the ground, but through the air. Last year he was on pace for 74 receptions, and I don't see that really changing all too much because they bring in Austin Hooper, but they also bring in an OC who wants to run the ball more and targeted the running back position 28% of the time as opposed to Cleveland's 23. So even though they bring in another piece, I think that'll offset with the volume going to the running back position. So this year, I see him being a top 24 type of guy, like a James White with rushing upside. Next year, he has a legitimate chance if he keeps his off-the-field actions clean to be like a top five or top six guy. And even if that's at the age of 27, he gets a two- or three-year deal. You're talking about a guy skyrocketing from the RB27 in dynasty circles to maybe like a top 15, top 12 guy, kind of where Kenyon Drake is right now, even though Kenyon Drake's on a one-year deal. It, it yeah, makes, it's crazy. Sorry, you can go. You go. I, I'm like, a, I don't know how I feel about Kareem Hunt because like I, I thought he was actually a lot better than he was at the end of last year. But then again, it's like a totally new coaching staff. I'm not sure how they're going to use him. But I'm always super wary about like, banking on someone getting a second contract like somewhere else because every year the cheapest asset is always the rookie class um so that's kind of like where i'm a little bit hesitant but like we also know that cream hunt's like really good right so it's it's like i'm like so iffy on him but like at his current price at rb27 i just feel like it's it's a good investment to make because again you're kind of priced to that downside uh whereas like you know you have the you have the upside i don't think he has, i don't think he has top 12 upside I don't even think he has a top 15 upside, but I think he has top 20 upside if he can get signed on a good team. Yeah, I, I would say I would say there's like an 80% chance he finishes from RB20 to RB24. I think that's what we're going to get out of him this year. But he's he's if you're looking at from a backup running back situation, he's arguably in like the worst spot. Like you can go sign with like the – anyone he signs with next year – is going to be better than where he is in Cleveland, right? And I still think he's going to do well this year. And, I mean, you, you said 26. He's 24 right now. He's going to turn 25 in a little bit. So, he'll be like 26 next offseason. But so that's 30. still – Yeah, then he's 30. Yeah. 26. <laughs> I think he retired. But he's still got a couple of years left for sure. Like, he can get a nice three-year contract and play that entire thing out while still in his prime because he doesn't have a lot of volume on his tires. So, I think um, – I, I love Kareem Hunt at that spot. I think he's going to finish better than that this year. And then his value is only going to go up because he's going to land in the – in a place with more opportunity. So uh, Kareem Hunt has a, a, a good floor this year. And then the ceiling is, I mean, he, he came in his fucking rookie year and won the rushing title, right? Like, I, I don't think he needs to prove anything. There's going to be some team out there that probably is already thinking about Kareem Hunt in their plans for 2021, like putting some money towards him rather than maybe investing in a, a high draft capital pick or something like that. Like, yes, it'll, it'll cost them a little bit of money, but maybe they want to use that draft capital elsewhere. I don't know. I just, I feel like Kareem Hunt is a, is a value where his his uh, his value is only going to go up, right? We like to draft players where their value won't be depreciating the following year, and I think um, I think Hunt's more likely than not goes up. He could cycle out Drake and pull in Hunt. I mean, that would make a lot of sense. He, he fits. He's he's very versatile, so I think he fits in a lot of offenses, especially the ones we're talking about that will have openings for running backs next year. Yeah, yeah. Next up, we got our boy Chase Edmonds. So I hope Kareem Hunt doesn't take over the Arizona job because we want Chase Edmonds, <laughs> the current RB fifty seven off the board. To get that lead role, this is, again, just playing on the hopes that 
you know, Kenyon Drake after this year doesn't resign and there's a sliver of a chance that Chase Edmonds gets the job. And considering that he's going behind a guy like DJ Dallas, who they just brought in Carlos Hyde, and now they have um, Rashad Penny and Chris Carson there. I think there's a better chance that Chase Edmonds gets on the field a little bit earlier. Tevin Coleman is off the books after next year, and that guy sucks. Uh, Tariq Cohen is basically a scat back that you never want to start. Josh Kelly, he's a charger, which means he automatically stinks and will probably tear his hamstring in preseason. So (laughs) you're banking on a guy who is sitting behind somebody on a one-year deal and the only investment they've made in the position was a seventh round pick in Eno Benjamin who closes his eyes and runs when he gets a handoff. So <laughs> he's somebody who flashed last year when was given the opportunity. Former Fordham Ram, got a friend that goes there. So shout out you. Hopefully you get drafted next year. And <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just think he has a good skill set for this offense, the ability to catch passes and the ability to run between the tackles where he tore off like those four touchdowns or three touchdowns against the New York Giants last year. That was a big enough flash for me to want to invest in him at the 177th pick overall, where basically at that point, you're just shooting for complete upside. And what better upside is there than the RB1 in an Arizona Cardinals offense? Yeah, I Michael. think, uh, you know, it, I know you're a Drake guy, so I'll let you combat this. Yeah, look, I, I, I don't think he, he's a handcuff, right? So at the end of the day, like, you can shoot for handcuffs. But I think, I think even if Drake goes down, it's hard for me to see him take a lead role just because he's, like, he's freaking tiny, right? He's, what, 5'9", like 205. I think he's, he's probably more built in that, like, Austin Eckler role. But, I mean... Well, Eckler's yeah, just a fucking like, beast. So watch your mouth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Eckler, Eckler's a beast, but Eckler's also a little bit of a little bit of a unicorn. And then the Chase Edmonds, like the second that he did get like any sort of like workload last year, he just like fell apart. So uh, I think like you know if, if Drake goes down, chances are he probably split some time with uh, you know eyes closed Benjamin, and <laughs> they they probably even bring in like another veteran thumper to kind of like split the load. That's how I kind of see them playing out, and then. I just don't see like the long-term viability as much. Like, cause like I said, you know, you're just, you're banking on, you know, them not drafting another rookie for cheap. If they draft another like fourth round rookie, then again, like his job kind of comes into question. But I think for this year, I mean, for redraft and, and even for this year, if you need like a filler, like he's a pretty good handcuff to have. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm super interested to see how they operate that backfield. Um, I don't know. What's your confidence level that, that Drake is, uh, I don't want to say 20 touches because I feel like that that gets thrown around in the NFL often. And like how many running backs finish the fucking year with 300 or 320 touches? Like not many. So I don't want to say 20, but like you think Drake is for sure in for a 17 to 18 touch workload? I think so. Yeah. The way Kingsbury used running backs last year, it was like weeks one through seven. David Johnson was getting like 19 touches a game. Edmonds and his two starts averaged like 19 and a half. And then I think down the stretch, Drake was around like 18 and a half to 19. So I think he wants to use yeah. uh, an all around back that you can just put on the field every snap. Yeah, this is going to be a, a, a funny thing to kind of look back on because, you know, you have Drake who's never actually done it for a full year, but he just exploded down the stretch. It's such a, a fun polarizing offense um, that something – some they're going to be fucking fireworks that come from that backfield, uh, most likely from Kenyon Drake. But I, I like Chase Edmonds too, man. Anytime he's gotten that chance to do it, he's he's shown well. But clearly, once they got Drake, he, he fell behind, even though obviously he was hurt for a little bit. But – um, I, I like Chase Edmonds here because you're looking at other guys like, like you said, Tariq Cohen is just not a guy I ever wants to. At least with Chase Edmonds, like you know when you're going to be able to start him, right? Yeah. If, if for some reason, like Kenyon Drake does go down, like that's when Chase Edmonds is going to go off. But like Tariq Cohen, you you will like fucking David Montgomery could pass away and you still wouldn't feel good about Tariq <laughs> Cohen. Mike Davis will have like 18 carries the next week. <laughs> They'll sign Mike Davis off. The Eddie Lacy would probably fucking ball yeah. out that week whenever it was. So Chase Edmonds, let's flip it to uh, a veteran running back, also yeah. a handcuff guy. Latavius Murray currently going off the board 198 RB 63. I am intrigued to to hear what the thought process behind this was because this seems like a a, a very much I guess it's just a straight up handcuff or I don't even want to say a floor play because I feel like that was it's a ceiling play I think what we uh, yeah so it's a it's a handcuff ceiling play because last year we kind of thought that okay maybe Latavius Murray has some juice left this is a great offensive line in New Orleans you give him a few holes he'll run through using that like breakaway uh, elite long speed but that wasn't the case. And he wasn't even really playing the goal line work. I know Alvin Kamara's touchdown numbers were down a lot, but I was looking at some of like the overall rates and, and ratios of it. Kamara still uh, took like 75 to 80% of the red zone carries, the goal line carries, the 10 zone targets. So it was like the role that we thought Murray might've had as the bigger back kind of evaporated last year. So I'm trying to figure out like where the value is left to squeeze out of Murray. Are you just like saying that, you know, we're so far down in the fucking draft 
that when you're there, no one has the ceiling that Latavius Murray had. Everyone, yeah. Everyone's floor is fucking terrible, but no one has that ceiling. Yeah, yeah. Look, this is not a – if Alvin Kamara plays, uh, he's going to be any value. Like, if Alvin Kamara right. plays, Latavius Murray is no value. But when Alvin Kamara was out, Murray was a beast, right? Like, he was an – I remember once so I won the DFS uh, – I won so much DFS just playing Latavius Murray as soon as Alvin Kamara went out just because you're in a high-powered offense, they're going to score. And when Kamara was gone, like, he got the goal line touches. So I think when you're in this range, right, you're basically only shooting for upside. And, you know, chances are, you know, Benjamin is going to give you zero starts for his entire fucking career. Tevin Coleman is trash. (laughs) Chase Uh, Edmonds, baby. Let's go. Ryquel, Armstead, like, you know, even if Leonard Fournette goes down, like, I don't even know what that offense is going to look like. So I'm not trying to invest in that offense. So if you're looking in this range, you want to find like high powered offenses and you want to. Animal, f- animal goes by and mumbles. I just, I just tweeted about Ryquel. <laughs> <laughs> That's so on brand. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to fucking look at what it is. Hold on. I'm going to say about something about how he steal, he stole. Okay. Wow. Wow. Look at me. Two exclamation points. Got another one of my guy. Got another uh, another one of guys in the nineteen. <laughs> yeah, you fucked it up, you idiot. Nineteen oh six. Ryquel Armstead. Fournette is basically done in Jacksonville. Only a matter of time before it's Ryquel season. <laughs> On logic, I love that. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I would much rather have Latavius Murray. Like if I'm trying to contend, even if I'm not trying to contend, right? Like you're just holding him on there, and if Kamara goes down, you just flip him for a third, right? And if you get a third at pick one ninety nine. That's good value. And if you're contending and the Kamar goes down, you have an RB1 on your hands. So this is like in, in this range of the draft, you're I'm basically shooting for like binary outcomes where, you know, if they hit, they hit big. And if they miss, like whatever, you just drop them. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And, and there was a week so last guys. year where I sat Chase Edmonds for Latavius Murray and I lost that week because of it. So I'm not the biggest <laughs> Latavius Murray fan. But as you say, Mike, right? When when Alvin Kamara is out, it was no secret that Latavius Murray was tearing everybody up. That Chicago run defense over the first half of the year was really good. And I remember he went out and he scored like two touchdowns after everybody was tweeting, don't start him. They don't allow any rushing touchdowns. Latavius <laughs> Murray is like, nah, fuck that noise. I'm going to go out and put up 35 fantasy points, but not enough for Noah to be able to start me over Chase Edmonds. So we're going to forget <laughs> that. But yeah, as you say, nobody else in this range really has that type of upside. He also caught a ton of passes when he was starting, which I found pretty surprising, even though he did that a little bit in Minnesota. But I guess that's just the offense that Drew Brees wants to run. He's a little bit older, so I don't see the longevity play. But if you're just playing for this year and you're a contender and you want that handcuff, go up and like send a fourth round pick for him in a rookie draft because that's probably all it's going to take for you to uh, acquire Latavius Murray. Yeah, I think he's. I think you kind of have to grab him as a handcuff if you're a Kamara guy. I'm looking at the other guys. He went at the 18-12 to Mike in our draft, and the other guys in that in that round were like Russell Gage. Damian Harris, Brissett, Jacob Eason, Antonio Ganey Golden, Corey Davis, DJ Dallas, Latavius Murray. So, so those were all animals picks. When you <laughs> when you look at it that way, it's like they all I mean, it's it's the 18th round of a dynasty startup. They all have a very good chance of not doing shit for you ever not having another fantasy relevant game in their career, but none of those guys have anywhere near the ceiling that Latavius Murray has. So that I guess that does make sense. When you it's wild. It. Animal has come up Kamara and he picked everyone except Latavius Murray. He was waiting on him. You sniped him, actually. <laughs> <laughs> rounds into the draft, you sniped yeah. him. <laughs> uh, all right, let's move on to the wide receiver group. Next up, my boy. I mean, I guess my boy for this year, but Devontae Parker. And this is just a case where, you know, I think, you know, I suffer from this. Like, I've been calling him a fraud for like four or five years uh, because he has been a fraud. But I think, are you overcompensating now? Uh, I don't think I'm overcompensating. I think I'm just adjusting. I'm just adjusting like naturally because he balled out. Be water like, might be year. water. He balled out this year, <laughs> and I think his price does not reflect what he has done, and his price does not reflect uh, the investment the team has made in him, and the price definitely does not reflect the upgrades the team has made with like Tua in terms of longevity. Um, and I think I think that like the wide receiver 31 price. He's one of the main reasons why I'm totally cool, like fading wide receiver early. He's still like 27, I think, going to be 28 next year 30. in his prime. Uh, in his prime. So, look, he's going to give you pretty decent production, I think. And if I'm betting on someone to produce out of that Miami offense, uh, I'm going to bet on Devontae Parker. And I think I'm taking that like that like painful history discount where like people just like are just like too they're not ready to trust him yet because it's like one year versus four years but i think there's been enough changes and he's shown enough from an efficiency perspective for me to buy in um because you know let's say like he just like compiled a bunch of shit like kelvin benjamin i wouldn't be as excited but he was pretty efficient a bunch of calories too 
yeah, he's just really good uh, as a wide receiver. So I'm totally happy copping this match. On I'm really surprised he's going all the way down at 90. I feel like that is so fucking that's so so low for Devontae Parker, considering like the ceiling that he could have. If he just operates as the wide receiver one all year, he's going to be easy top 15 wide receiver, and he's got that contract extension again. Like people so underestimate just having the safety of being on a team and knowing your fucking role for the next couple of years. You don't have to fucking sneak by like they, like you think these people. Why is he, I haven't? Oh, is he, I'd love to see you on. I've heard him. I've heard him giggling, and I didn't know if that was a TV or animal. <laughs> He's been giggling for fucking twenty straight minutes. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Yeah, Devontae Parker. Fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I think the years with Adam Gase and him being injured really tainted our perspective on on Devontae Parker. But the fact that last year, after Preston Williams went down, which People are saying that's to me a reason why he's not going to do as well this year. I do think Preston Williams is good, but he's coming off an ACL tear. He's undrafted. Devontae Parker is getting the bag, so they're going to be using him. Uh, I think those down years are kind of being over – they're being talked about way too much because what he showed last year against top-tier competition, burning Stephon Gilmore and then burning Michael Thomas on Twitter, just tells me he's <laughs> a very, very good wide receiver. And now Chen Gailey is the OC in this offense. And back in the Jets, he had multiple fantasy-relevant wide receivers with Eric Decker and Brandon Marshall because he throws to his wide receivers a ton in the red zone. One year, they both had 20 red zone targets. And if they're down around the red zone, I don't see Mike Kosicki taking over that role. He's not a big touchdown guy. Preston Williams could get that role. But that also means Devontae Parker will have the opportunity to command you know, a pretty big target share inside the red zone. So he's picking up those chunk yardages uh, on deep plays. He's going to be a red zone monster for this team. He scored, a point, uh, I think he had like nine touchdowns last year. So, yeah, he's, he's still in his prime, and people are picking him as if he's on a downward trend in his career when he just basically started last year. You don't think, uh, you don't think Jordan Howard's going to be the main red zone target? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for them to make a third. We need, I think that's going to be uh, a, a piece of content that Big Dogs is going to have to make. Like a video, uh, We're going to have to do a 30 for 30 on all the guys. <laughs> like, it's going to be like how the Oklahoma City Thunder, they're going to do it on them, how they had KD, James Harden, whatever. We're going to have to do that with Adam Gase. Like, what if we told you he made a wide receiver 72 into, you know, some shit like that. So we got to take all the fantasy players that Adam Gase has ever had Turn yeah. it into a fucking featured film, and we'll send it to him. We'll tweet That's at it. That's animal's excuse for <laughs> Michael Piron for the next four years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So Devontae Parker, grab that motherfucker. Who else we got? Yeah. Next up, uh, Christian Kirk, favorite of mine, uh, and Noah's as well. He's going as the wide receiver, thirty-four, ninety-eighth uh, off the board after Devontae Parker. Uh, guys going ahead of him are like Rugs and Thielen. And look, I love Thielen for this year. I actually think he's a pretty decent value too. But just given where, where they are in their age uh, in their age curve, like I'm definitely copping this match on Christian Kirk all day. Uh, you know, people are going to not like the fact that Nuke came over. But at the end of the day, like I always viewed Kirk as a wide receiver too. Like I've never viewed him as a wide receiver one. And I think having Nuke there is good for him. Uh, and as Larry kind of like fizzles out and, you know, this offense like takes that next step forward, like he's going to be the one that really develops with Kyler. Uh, you know, and we've talked about his – his profile coming in, he was an elite profile coming in. He actually did really good his rookie year, despite playing with Josh Rosen. And he took a bit of a step back last year. Uh, was was hurt as well. Uh, really only had that one blow up week. But look, I'm I'm still all in on Christian Kirk at wide receiver three prices. Yeah, he's somebody that I was super high on a little bit earlier before the D Hop trade, and then he obviously fell down in my rankings. But where he's going at the wide receiver thirty four. That's a price I'm willing to pan him because, as Mike said, he's still super young. He's still building chemistry with Kyler Murray. And the situation he was put in, right, he was catching passes from Sammy Sleeves. He was catching passes from Josh Rosen. He was trying to catch passes from Kyler Murray in a brand-new offense with Cliff Kingsbury, who would not throw the ball or do anything other than kick from inside the five-yard line. Now he's in an offense that has an actual alpha to take away targets. No shade thrown at you, Larry Fitzgerald, but you're about, like, 150 years old. <laughs> and it's an offense that wants to throw the ball – and be high volume. So although they do have an alpha in DeAndre Hopkins there, they had two wide receivers last year put up over 100 targets, and Christian Kirk didn't play a full season. So even if Hopkins goes out there and commands his 150, 160, 170 targets, he can be a guy who is extremely efficient on 100 to 110 targets and put up a pretty good season, like a Tyler Lockett light type of season if he builds that chemistry with Kyler Murray where he can extend plays while Kyler Murray is scrambling outside the pocket. Yeah, he's, he's such a good um... – like role player to have on it's a weird term to use for a fantasy team but like mike said if you know your place with christian kirk you know he's not going to give you the wide receiver one upside but 
last year. I mean, it was the first year with Kyler Murray. It was the first year with everything kind of starting to click. He's averaging double-digit half PPR fantasy points, 108 targets in 13 games. I mean, that's going to – he's going to – flirt with 120 targets this year even with D Hop there because this is going to be a pretty high volume passing offense going forward I will say though like Adam Thielen around that spot like uh no when you grabbed him in our league and I think it was like the 9-6 or 9-7 that was you know that was one of those picks again where you're just like it can't fall any further than that it would be fucking irresponsible of us to let him go any further I think he's a great value pick too because he's someone who's who's redraft his redraft outlook just for this year is worth the ninth round eighth yeah. round investment because he could anchor you you could have faded wide receivers this year you know picked up running backs tight ends whatever and still get wide receiver one production out of Thielen with Stefan Diggs gone so uh, yep. I like Thielen there I like Christian Kirk there I actually personally would probably grab Thielen over Kirk in most situations unless you know you're in full you know go for it next year or the year after mode though I think Thielen probably has like two probably two really solid years uh, ahead of him but Kirk yeah I mean th- there's there's nothing bad to like about the situation he's in he's just a very good player a very good prospect we've seen him do it on the NFL field he's got an up-and-coming quarterback who's an, an elite prospect that's coming into the prime of his career one of the most you know engaging offenses that we'll see in the NFL so uh, all signs point to this just being a, a good investment into a player there's nothing there's nothing not to like about it up bing, next bing, Another guy who is perceived to be old. We have Robert Woods, the wide receiver for the Rams, currently wide receiver 29 off the board. And Nick, I'll ask you this question. Who is everybody except Mike's wide receiver one for Dynasty? Uh, CeeDee Lamb. Yes, Michael Thomas. You're right. <laughs> Michael oh, Thomas. I thought you meant rookies. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm thinking like a rookie right now. That's why I went to rookies. All good. Michael Thomas is one year younger than Robert Woods. And the only reason why Robert Woods is the wide receiver 29 in Dynasty is because people think he is old. The guy is going to be 28 years old this season. He's put up back-to-back seasons with 1,200 yards. He is playing with a quarterback that got a crazy and probably dumb extension with the Rams. He's just one of the highest floor guys you can get in Dynasty. I believe he signed for two more years there, so maybe he's going to be looking for a contract when he's 30, but... Everything he's shown is that he can be versatile. He can eventually move into the slot where he doesn't have to be as athletic to win and be an outside wide receiver. And what he showed down the stretch the last seven or eight games, he was the wide receiver five over that span. He was on pace for like 120 catches, 1,500 yards, and a very uh, Robert Woods-esque five touchdowns. And every single game over that span, five of the seven was over 95% of of the offensive snaps. The other two was around the 80 mark, but he put up like 160 yards in one of them. And I think he topped 100 in the other one as well. And those are both coming off the one week where he like randomly missed a game. So maybe that had to do with it. I don't know. I just see a guy who is going to be a fringe wide receiver one for as long as he is in Los Angeles. And what's to say he doesn't go there after his contract expires. They re-sign him. Uh, He's just a really good floor play in an offense that may be using two tight end sets more often. But even if that's the case, those two tight end sets, he was still on the field a ton for those he was you know he's not a red zone type of guy but he gets enough volume for you that even in half PPR leagues he's going to flirt with top 12 top 15 numbers year after year so he's in the similar vein as Adam Thielen for me where you can argue him being a wide receiver one for this season and there's a really realistic chance that going forward in the future he's going to continue that production yeah I love Woods because the the concern going into this year is what do we see as the base offense for LA? You know, is it three wide receivers or do they do the two wide receiver sets like we saw a lot of last year? And with Woods, the great part about him is it doesn't matter because he's versatile enough that he's good on the outside. He's good in the slot, which he doesn't really play that much because Cooper Cup is the slot guy. But if they go to two two wide receivers, like Cup is going to be the one that has his work cut out for him because he's he's not someone who wins athletically. He's not someone who's skilled as a tactician, uh, technician. And Robert Woods is much uh, more suited to play on the outside so if they go two more tight ends and we should see a lot more what we saw down the stretch from Woods so yeah like like with Thielen uh, Woods if you faded the position you're going to get top 15 production from Robert Woods you're going to get it from Thielen so these guys in like the eighth ninth round you'll get good production out of both of them probably for like two to three year spans and um, the age thing yeah like 27 28 years old is not you know it's not time to be completely concerned when you're investing into a guy in the ninth round Bobby Trees, man, love him. Draft them everywhere. That's all I'll love, say. Love that. Next up, we got another guy that we talked about, I believe, last week. It's Tyler Lockett, the wide receiver for the Seattle Seahawks, currently wide receiver 32 overall, and that's that's just utter disrespect. I think people are thinking that just because DK Metcalf is good, 
means that Tyler Lockett can't be good, even though last year we saw both of them be good. So I don't see how that equation makes any type of sense. But even though DK Metcalf took that step forward throughout the season, Tyler Lockett was the wide receiver one in this offense for the entire year. Before he hurt his calf, his pace for the season was 99 receptions, 1,269 yards, and 10 touchdowns. And people might say, oh, he's just a guy that relies on his speed. As he gets older, he's 28. As he gets older, he's not going to have that in his repertoire anymore. He led the league in red zone targets. He led the league in red zone receptions. And he was third in the league in red zone touchdowns with seven. He is basically Doug Baldwin all over again, but younger, more explosive for now at least. And as he ages, he's going to be somebody that can move into the slot, be more of a technician as he's shown already in his career, and just be somebody that is Russell Wilson's safety blanket and somebody that he has shown immense chemistry with over the past two seasons. Uh, Curtis Patrick actually put up a tweet that he is like one of seven receivers over the past two years to put up 225 plus fantasy points in back-to-back years. He also has the second most receiving touchdowns over the past two years. He is just Doug Baldwin for him all over again. They have immense chemistry. He had like a 158.3 quarterback rating when targeting Lockett in 2018. And even if DK Metcalf takes that step forward, which everybody thinks he will, Tyler Lockett isn't somebody that needs 150 targets to be a wide receiver one. He saw like 120 this year, and he was still a fringe wide receiver one. So in an offense that isn't going to be a high-volume passing offense, it's pretty consolidated between those two guys. And even if he sees 110 to 120 targets, he's going to be efficient enough on those catches and on those opportunities to be able to flirt with top 15 numbers. And going outside the top 30, I just I don't understand that price for somebody who's going to be a very valuable contributor for you, for you for at least the next two years. Yeah, I mean the Tyler Lockett to Russell Wilson connection, like I don't I don't even think this is a hot take. This is supported by like the number side of things. They're probably the best connection in the NFL. And the only Herbert and we, Keenan Allen though, they've been working in LA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the only reason why like people don't talk about him as much is because obviously, you know, Tyler Lockett isn't someone that gets like 170 targets. So you're not gonna get Drew Brees and Michael Thomas type numbers. But on like a target basis, like target for target basis. Like the efficiency that they achieve on like deep balls, uh, like TD conversion, like everything is like the passer passer rating, which is actually a pretty bad metric, but just everything that they do together is like elite. And you know, I like I like DK Metcalf, right? And I think he'll continue to take that step forward. But to me, I think it's so clear that Tyler Lockett is still the dude in Seattle. Um, and I think he's just going like way, way, way too cheap. Uh, and if you're like a contender and you know, you believe in Russ and you want to get a piece of that passing game, I think getting the Tyler Lockett discount to DK Metcalf is probably like the ideal path to go similar to how, uh, Robert Woods is a bit of a, is a bit of an arbitrage to Cooper cup. I think that Tyler Lockett is a bit of an arbitrage to DK Metcalf. Yeah. Um, that the chemistry between them two is just is, is so real. I feel like if if you could like there would be no one more upset if you had someone like a team moved a certain player away from that team and another player on the team would be really pissed about it. I don't I don't know if it'd be you could find someone more pissed about the Seattle Seahawks moving Tyler Lockett than Russell Wilson be. And I feel like Russell Wilson is a very low key guy, but he would be upset about this because the the chemistry between those two, like you said, is so unmatched. And there, I don't understand. Like, there's no reason. I understand trying to get ahead of the curve and be like, yes, this is DK Metcalf's like step up breakout year, and Lockett's gonna fall to the uh, to the wayside. But there's been nothing we have seen that would suggest that. Like, there's no evidence that Tyler Lockett is not old. It's not like their chemistry fell off last year. So. Uh, yeah, I, I think the arbitrage play of Lockett over Metcalf is even better than than Woods over Cup. So Lockett um, going all the way down here. Yeah, I, I think he has even more longevity than the other guys. I think he's an actual uh, staple of that offense just because of how much Russell Wilson loves uh, loves own this guy. Yeah, exactly. And next up, someone that I've been pounding the drum for like for I don't know so long now, and it seems like you know he's getting a little bit more Twitter love recently. But it's Marvin Jones Jr. And I think if you are a contending team and you're not making a move for Marvin Jones Jr., I think you're doing yourselves a great disservice. Uh, this is the greatest arbitrage play available. He's currently going as at 165 as the wide receiver 59. And when he was healthy last season, he was putting up wide receiver two numbers. Um, Kenny Galladay was averaging, I believe, 15.5 points per game last year uh, in PPR formats, Marvin Jones was averaging 14.9. So for a 
basically half point difference. You're getting like almost like, what is it? Like eight round discount. Cause Kenny Galladay is currently going in the fourth round more than an eight round discount. So obviously the value of Kenny Galladay is going to continue to go up. But if you're looking at it from a contender stand standpoint, like I basically sent out offers like in, I don't know, February or so. And every single league I'm a contender, I sent out like an offer of like a third round pick for Marvin Jones. And more often than not, that got it done. Uh, I think now maybe you have to pay like a couple thirds or try and get him as a throw in. But he's just like, he, he's like one of those guys where like, I think wide receivers don't matter, especially when you have like all the people on like Twitter being like, oh, you can get this guy at wide receiver five prices and he'll get you like a wide receiver for three production. Who gives a fuck? Nobody cares. Like that's not going to do you any, any favors. That's not going to win the week. But Marvin Jones is potentially giving you like wide receiver two numbers. And on any given week, he's giving you like wide receiver one upside. So I think that's the type of upside I'm going to choose to chase uh, at the wide receiver position. Another reason why like you can get values like this late in draft, you can fade wide receiver early. Yeah, he's I'm a having a hard time. Wide receivers. Like, you know, he's going to get hurt, but the weeks that he plays, he's going to be very good for you. And he did have that one game that boosted his production. He had four touchdowns. And if you take out that one game, which we don't like to do, he goes from the wide receiver 18 to the wide receiver 38. But even then, he's being drafted as the wide receiver 59. And even if it's for one or two more seasons, like that's still good value in an offense that, you know, we want TJ Hawkinson to be good. It takes a little bit for tight ends to break out. We know Marvin Jones is a huge weapon in the red zone, in the end zone. Uh, I think he had like, a, I think he had like nine red zone targets this year in like 13 games, which would be paced that out. Uh, or inside the 10 targets like it, it would have ranked among like the top 10 guys so he's just somebody that gets the high value deep targets the the red zone and end zone targets for him to be an every week starter for you as a flex option where you can grab him in what like the the 14th 15th round yeah with Jones I there are I mean I guess the, the price that you're getting him at there's really no need to even discuss the red flags because everyone down there has ridiculous red flags but he is 30, so he is actually old for a wide receiver. He's actually to, 30. But yeah, he's, he's actually 30, not 22 turning 30. Um, he hasn't finished the season since 2017. So usually when you're getting older and you start dealing with the injuries, you know, it, it's a little tougher to come back from them. He has seen his yards per reception number dip in three straight seasons. So maybe it's a lack of explosion. Maybe it's that some of the deep targets are going towards Kenny Galladay, which is definitely a fact. You know, he's getting – a ton of deep balls and that's pulling away from Marvin Jones's game a little bit, but he has been a very consistent staple down by the red zone. He's always one of Stafford's um, first looks. So if Stafford's back and healthy, then you have to like Marvin Jones as a, as a potential wide receiver two candidate. But I mean, the, the beware, obviously, um, you know, red flags there, of course, the injuries of the last couple of years, and he's competing now for the wide receiver two role, expecting TJ Hawkinson to still slowly acclimate into a, an actual weapon for for Stafford so yeah if you're competing for this year I mean it makes no sense not to not to take Marvin Jones where he's being drafted bingo last one yep moving over to tight ends we got our boy Tyler Higby the tight end 10 off the board and going 107th overall this just doesn't make that much sense to me he's going a lot later than Darren Waller who both of them have one year of production and they're both 27 but he's like younger than Darren Waller because he was born before or born after Darren Waller uh, he's going after Noah Fant who I personally don't think is that good. He's not somebody who's going to get a ton of targets. They bring in, <laughs> they bring in, uh, court, though they have Court and Sutton, they bring in Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler, Melvin Gordon, the God out of the backfield. There's just going to be so many targets to, there's not going to be enough targets to go around there. Whereas Tyler Higby is in an offense that down the stretch last year showed that they wanted to use him a ton. Those last handful of weeks that he was out there, he was averaging 11.2 targets a game. That's obviously not going to remain this year because Cooper Cup down the stretch wasn't being used as heavily. With Brandon Cooks out of the fold, Todd Gurley not there to run for like three yards and fumble every carry. Um, you know, there's, there's still targets for them to go around and still throw to Tyler Higby as much as they were last year. He was huge for them in the red zone. He actually led the team in red zone targets with 19. But over the last five weeks, he put up 13 red zone targets, which was 2.6 a game. And he averaged one red zone, one uh, inside the 10 target over those last five weeks per game. So he's somebody that is not only giving you overall volume, but he's giving you touchdown upside. And in Dynasty, you can't just scavenge and go, go after the waiver wire to pick up a tight end to start for you week to week. You need to have the depth at the position or one of the elite guys. And when you're talking about the elite of the elite, I see Tyler Higby as one of them because he is still relatively young for the tight end position. He's 27 and he's signed through 2023 and he seems to be a big part of this offense going forward. So I don't see he's, why he's going behind any of those names, even like a Hunter Henry who's going through a quarterback change this year and cannot stay healthy. Like I would much rather have Tyler Higby at his price going later than all those guys. 
Yeah, yeah, I think if Everett broke out last year, we would be so much more excited about Everett just because he's a little bit more athletic. But like Higby took on everything we wanted Everett to be, and Everett's going to be gone. You know, after, I believe his contract is up after this year, so Higby becomes a guy. It was, it's, it's, it's a little tough to buy into it only because it was such a small sample size at the end of the year. But it was just so fucking good, and everything is set up for it to continue to be really good there. Like we said, they go with the two tight end sets. They're going to use the other tight end as probably a blocker and let Higby kind of run free and uh, be that you know primary over the middle um, option for Jared Goff, who seems to to love Higby. So yeah, I don't know if he's a guy I'm, I'm like necessarily targeting as a great value in every draft, but he's someone I definitely want to have some um, some piece of because he showed just how high his upside could be. Yeah, also, been, I want to throw in these ADPs are for tight end premium leagues, and he's going 107th overall, which is what, like round nine, like the beginning of yeah. round nine. I think that's a huge steal when you're getting the volume that he's getting, giving you 1.5 points per reception. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I've been missing out on the elite tight ends, I've basically been waiting on Higby on the on the back end of the later on in the draft. And look, he, he had an incredible year, right? Like it's not hyperbole to say that five game stretch was the greatest five game stretch by any tight end in like NFL history. So, hey, Mike, I got a stat right here. But who's counting? Only tight end since Kellen Winslow Jr. to put up 80 yards in five straight games. So a good a good comp, uh, athletically not great morally, but yeah, five game stretch (laughs) for Kellen Winslow. Yeah, yeah, 80 games, five game stretch. I think four of those games he scored. uh, He had 100 yards or more. And like if you look at it from the efficiency perspective, he was outstanding. Uh, He ranked with any with receivers running backs and uh, tight ends with 50 or more targets. He ranked seventh overall in yards per route run at 2.6. And, you know, those types of efficiency metrics are the ones that are tend to be more sticky and earn you more volume year after year. Uh, So it's really interesting to see someone like him who people are not excited about. And then you look at someone like Mike Kosicki, who everyone's hyped about because he had also really good counting stats at the end of last season. But when you look at him, he had 1.09 yards per route run. Spoiler alert, guys, that is not fucking good. That is absolute trash. Uh, you know, that ranks 112th uh, out of all receivers, running backs, and tight ends. So when you like, I think a lot of people are going to be like, well, I'm going to fade Higby and get someone like Gesicki. Like, you really need to look at the efficiency stats for tight ends. I think that's what's going to get you the production and the stickiness year over year. And we already talked about, like, the way their offense is, has shift. Like, they don't have the offensive line to really run, like, super heavy wide receive, uh, three wide receiver sets uh, like they used to back in the heydays. And in the red zone, like, Bobby's trees, I love that dude, but he's not really a red zone threat. Cooper Cup is, but it's really just between Cooper Cup and Tyler Higby when it comes down to getting touchdowns as well. So I think he's really built up for, like, a nice year. He's got that pretty sneaky, like, top five upside. You know, right now he's going pretty late in BDG leagues. In leagues that I'm in, he's going a little bit earlier at, like, you know, tight end eight, tight end seven. So he's going at value. Uh, But I think right now in big dogs leagues, like, he's definitely someone you guys should be clicking the smash and uh, drafting on. Yeah, so go fucking join a big dogs league right now. You do that by joining Discord. Absolutely free. So get in there. We got over fucking 2,000 members, which is incredible. Remember when we were going to cut it off at like 500? <laughs> yeah, right. I remember on Slack, I was hyped at like 45 members. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When, we got, <laughs> when we switched everyone over from Slack to Discord, it was such a fuck show. Some guy uh, just DM'd me today on Slack asking to join the Discord. I'm like, man, where have you been? <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah, so we got a lot of heads over there in Discord and a lot of leagues going off. So if you want to take advantage of some of these ADP numbers, these arbitrage numbers, we let out some of our favorite values values for y'all today i hope you guys enjoyed if you did make sure you hit that thumbs up button subscribe to the channel if y'all are new we will be back with dynasty content every single wednesday make sure you follow these two hooligans on twitter if you want some more uh nuggets throughout the week if you can't wait till wednesday if you want access to the adp as well as our rankings as well as all of our rookie profiles uh mike's big dogs dynasty startup bible which is an absolute fucking thing of beauty i read it over today it's going to be published either tomorrow or by the time you guys see this it'll probably be live um that's you can either get it on bigdogsdraftguide.com or if you're in a state that is eligible for you know FanDuel, DraftKings, those states go to monkeyknifefight.com use the promo code bdge when you sign up and you will get all the guides for free with your you gotta play a game though deposit. play a two dollar game you do have to play a $2 game, so don't fucking not play and then email me about why you didn't get your damn guy. Thank you for throwing that in there, Mike. All right, uh, I think that's all we got for today. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Miss the narrative. Peace. We got oh, one. do you want to add the narrative? Yeah, I got a narrative. All right, fuck it. We ain't done. We ain't, fu- we ain't fucking leaving. I'm not leaving. I'm not fucking leaving. <laughs> Ha <laughs>
<laughs> we fucking leave it. All right. This week's narrative. Alexander Madison is as good as Dalvin Cook. What do you guys think? I think he's better. <laughs> Get the um, fuck out of here. Uh, no, this I, I, is this a rhetorical question? Like, do I have to answer this? Yeah, you do. Because, I mean, there's actually real-life people out there that, I mean, first of all, like, Arby's don't matter, Cold obviously. experts, Mike, and they're very smart. <laughs> Yeah, but like I mean, there, I, today my Twitter feed is filled with clips of Alexander Madison balling out uh, on a small sample size, albeit. But you know they think that without Dalvin Cook there, like Madison is probably like he's like flirting with like RB one territory. So I would like if, to see if um, Cook holds out. Where do you guys have him? That's the better for this question season, for the season. No, uh, no, get that first because I want to look at a few numbers real quick. I would definitely say inside the top 12. I mean, we saw Mike Boone last year get like two starts and the first game wasn't great, but the second game, I think it was against Green Bay and he just like tore their faces off. And I think he has that skill set to be a guy that can play on all three downs. He's a decent enough pass catcher. and He was efficient on the volume he was given this year. So I think if Dalvin Cook were to go down, I don't think it's crazy to see him as like a top 12, top 10 guy, especially in that type of offense where they want to run the ball a lot. They have a good run blocking offensive line. I actually don't know that, but I'm just assuming based on what they did last year. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't hate Madison. I think you can get him, like, right now. Obviously, right now in Dynasty Startups, he's probably he's about going to jump way up higher like than he should be because of this. But I have no clue what you just said, but I'll, I'll let you go now because I, I was just rambling at that point. I love that I just, like, I, I've done that 10 times this episode where I just cut you off and you can't actually hear what I'm yeah. saying. <laughs> you just, like, pause me. Fucking <laughs> um no, I'm saying he's probably his ADP is probably going to jump up to like the fucking eighth round after this Dalvin Cook news. But I think what's so underrated with Dalvin Cook is like not only does he operate as the workhorse, but there there are like a lot of running backs to operate with very high workloads, but they can't like Dalvin Cook legit breaks away for like 70 yard touchdowns um, almost biweekly, and he also can catch 65 to 70 passes in a in a given season. And most running backs, even if they're given a full workload, can't do either of those things. And Madison definitely proved uh, myself wrong. He's a lot more talented than I thought he would be on an NFL field. And I do agree he's definitely – he would have to be inside your top 10 running backs if uh, if Dalvin Cook does hold out for the season. Um, I don't know I'm, – some people would probably start throwing him into like the RB6 or 7 spot. That's just not something I'm, I don't think I'm willing to do. Uh, I don't think he's anywhere near the pass catcher that Dalvin Cook is. And he doesn't give you those explosive plays that Dalvin Cook is. And Cook also reminds me of a guy like Aaron Jones when they're on the, uh, on the goal line. Like, very shifty, very good vision. He knows the holes to hit. He doesn't need to be big to get into the end zone. And I think that's an underrated part of Dalvin Cook's game, too. Last year, he had, I think, 13 rushing touchdowns in 13 or 14 games. Um, so these are all things that are underrated when it comes to Dalvin Cook that I don't think it's just a plug-and-play replacement. So Madison, yeah, he'd be really good because his floor would be so high, but I don't think he offers anywhere near the ceiling that Dalvin Cook would over the full stretch of a season. Yeah, I mean, like, if you guys don't remember, like, Dalvin Cook was averaging, like, 25 points per game in PPR last year. Like, he was, like, neck and neck with Christian McCaffrey until McCaffrey kind of went super ham. Mm -hmm. um, but, look, I think it is tricky, right? Because I think the new CBA, I'm trying to, like, understand it. It's like every source I read is a little bit different. But if the new CBA applies this year, it's going to be very hard for Dalvin Cook to hold out for any significant amount of time. Like, even through, like, training camp, he's, like, it's costing him, like, like 40k like you can a just day. drop him out an album like love bell though and make that yeah work. <laughs> yeah and then and then a few days after a few days you like basically lose another like season that counts towards your free agency eligibility so i look i i, I would advise people to not panic and go out and start paying like you know a bunch of like second round picks and like drafting madison in like the 10th round of startups it's, I just don't think it's worth it because you're going to get into a very same situation as like you got with Zeke and Pollard. Um, like, look, Cook's asking for like, what, 13 million? He's not getting that. We all know that. Yeah. But like, that's like the starting point. I do think like given the Vikings philosophy and what they want to do, uh, there's like better chance for them to kind of get to resolution than like someone like Le'Veon Bell and uh, or even uh, Melvin Gordon last year. So I'm not like that concerned yet that Cook's holding out just because there's so many things working against him. Um, and I, I do think he's going to play the season. Yeah, yeah. this is like a Daryl Henderson type of situation last year when we found out that Todd Gurley's knee was shit and like everybody started drafting him really high and it didn't matter. Like obviously if, if Dalvin Cook holds out, Alexander Madison's going to be a huge value for you right now if you buy. 
But I think the way his price is trending up right now, I'd much rather just miss out on him than overpay for somebody who's never going to make my starting lineup. Yeah, like you're going to you're gonna buy Alexander Madison for the same price that you can get like Adam Thielen when this is all set. Yeah, like yeah two, pretty much. You can get a backup running back or you can get like a top eight <laughs> wide receiver for the year. So yeah, I, I'm not about to go nuts over it. If I'm a Dalvin Cook owner, uh, I'm obviously a little bit skeptical, and I would hope that if you are a Dalvin Cook owner, then you took Alexander Madison in the 13th round instead of waiting for the 14th round for someone to fucking snipe him from you. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with these two, and I, I'm not about to get as excited as some people are uh, in the industry. He's one of those guys that, like, if you liked him as a prospect, now you, this is your chance to be like, oh, he'd be a top three fucking running back if Dalvin Cook holds out. So, All right. That's all, folks. That's the real end. Yeah, it's a real Thank end. Thank you for sticking around. Get on that Big Dogs ADP. Get on the Big Dogs draft guide. Get in the Discord. Read the Bible tomorrow. A lot of shit. Just, just